Hello and welcome.、Um, I'm Kazu Kojima from WHO World Health Organization for Biosafety and Laboratory Biosecurity, and also、uh, the manual that I'm going to talk that is about WHO Laboratory Biosafety Manual, fourth edition, so called LBM4. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a、um, brief introduction of the WHO's、uh, Laboratory Biosafety Manual 4th Edition, key revision concept that is evidence and risk based approach, and followed by some global context of biosafety and biosecurity. And then, what is risk?、Uh, we are going to discuss、uh, about the risk, and then, risk assessment framework. I'm going to give you some examples for your understanding. Learning objectives. As I said,、um, some global context of biosafety and, of course, introduction of WHO's Laboratory Biosafety Manual, LBM4, fourth edition. And then evidence and risk based approach, some basics in risk assessment that I'm going to talk. Well,、uh, LBM4. WHO's Laboratory Biosafety Manual, fourth edition, that was newly and fully revised and published. And some elevator pitch and best practice sharing. This is about best、um, practice sharing, evidence and risk based approach. And this is a practical guidance for global, truly global audience. And when compared to ISO 35001, that is about management system standard. Uh, but our LBM4 is about practical guidance, best practice sharing. And this document, although it's very widely、uh, referred and used, but it's not legally binding, unlike IHL, International Health Regulations of WHO. That means that、um, violation would not result in a fine, but、um, observance may enhance your safety. That is our intent. And this is believed to be de facto regulatory document in some unregulated countries and of,、um, often referred by diverse sectors and countries, including, of course,、um, human health,、uh, diagnostic laboratories, research laboratories, pharmaceutical companies, but even food industry in some cases. And that means that it's applicable to all laboratories, irrespective of resources. And we are aiming at equitable, flexible, locally applicable, and therefore sustainable biosafety with this publication. WHO Laboratory Biosafety Manual, fourth edition. This is a suite of documents consisting of so called core document, main document, and supplemented by seven subject specific monographs. So, I would suggest that you first read through core document, main document, and then、uh, you pick up some of the monographs that you are particularly interested in. Something like biosafety program management or risk assessment, or if you are interested in PPE, then you may wish to take a look at a PPE monograph, something like this. And then with LBM4, we are covering diverse. Topics including risk assessment, control, and review, and also core requirements for biosafety, options for heightened control measures, maximum contained measures for very high risk operations. That means that we are no longer talking about so called BSL or biosafety level with this publication of LBM4. And this、uh, covers Transfer and transportation of infectious substances, biosafety program management, and a little bit about bio laboratory biosecurity, and、um, followed by national and international biosafety oversight. These are some of the topics that LBM4 is going to cover. With this、uh, global map,、um, Biosafety and biosecurity regime achievement is、um, outlined. This is、um, um, IHL, International Health Regulations, state parties or member states,、um, annual self reporting about biosafety and biosecurity. 
And this map shows that, yes, uh, some of the countries have made good achievements, but unfortunately, mostly resource-limited countries are still struggling to achieve and maintain good biosafety and biosecurity regime. That is the reality. And also, obviously, this is a picture taken during the big Ebola outbreak back in 2014, somewhere in West Africa. Clearly, um, Ebola virus is often recognized as um, risk group four or highest um, uh, risk um, pathogen, hazard group pathogen. And then as this picture shows that uh, there is no such biocontainment level. Um, what they are using is just a plastic tent or a glove box, but this gave them enough uh, separation between the pathogen and the operators. And thanks to goodness, we have hardly ever had any laboratory associated infection, even in this kind of makeshift laboratories. So clearly, we cannot equate pathogen risk, such as Ebola virus, that is risk group four, and biosafety containment level. BSL-4 in this case, it is not attainable in such operations. So we often talk about risk, but what do you mean by risk exactly? Risk consists of hazard biological agent or somewhat consequence and procedure on activity that relate to likelihood of uh, something um, undesirable happens and that equates to risk. So risk consists of two major elements, that is consequence and likelihood. Risk is about the combination of consequence and likelihood, in other words. So let's have a look at um, SARS-CoV-2 that uh, presents an excellent example uh, in our risk-based approach. Take the case of um, antigen uh, rapid diagnostic test, lateral flow uh, testing. Uh, it's performed even your nearby uh, pharmacy. That means that outside the laboratory controlled area, I would call it BSL zero because it's outside the laboratory. And um, in the case of points of care or near points of care testing, this can be performed in very basic BSL one laboratory environment. But when it comes to conventional PCR, uh, you may need to um, use PSL2 environment. And then virus isolation, normally it's done in PSL3 environment. But if you really want to manipulate the virus, genetic manipulation, or gain the function type of uh, experiments, you may need to employ PSL4 or maximum containment environment. So that means that the same pathogen, in this case, SARS-CoV-2 virus, can be recommendably handled in diverse um, containment levels, ranging from kind of zero, one, two, three, and four. That is the highest. That is what we call is risk-based approach. So yes, of course, the biological characteristics of um, pathogen is quite important. But so is the activities, ex um, exactly what are you going to do with the pathogen that is equally important. That is uh, what we call is risk-based approach. Take another look at this uh, risk um, model. Um, consequence, uh, you know, depending on the pathogen, uh, the consequence can vary from something neg negligible moderate when you know the uh, infection can be easily treatable but in some cases um, the pathogen may pose high mortality and even worse that can easily spread to the community so that's the highest consequence in this case and when it comes to likelihood yes uh, some of the experiments are relatively believed to be um, safe but vortex mixing may generate some aerosol that may um, expose you. And large volume and high titer or using animals, sharps, and grasswares, all these may pose very high likelihood of the um, occurrence or events. Um, but some of the elements, such as large volume and high titer, 
as I mentioned, this relates to likelihood, but also in case of accident, the consequence would be high because you have large volume, high titer, and nasty uh, consequence can be imagined. So all these uh, combined together will formulate risk in our model. Well, next, um, this is about risk assessment framework. Just like quality management system, PDCA, plan, do, check, act, cycle, we do have a very similar uh, circle that is a risk assessment framework. Starting with gather, gathering information, so-called hazard identification, exactly what kind of hazards you have in your plan, what you are going to do, and then followed by evaluate the risks. Perhaps you may want to use this kind of risk matrix or risk heat map or type of thing. Uh, considering likelihood and also, as I said, consequence of the experiment that you are now emphasizing. And then develop a risk control study, st strategy sorry, um, based upon the resources, technologies, and available things. And you have to think about exactly what kind of risk control measures you can um, implement. And then you can select and implement risk control measures. You have to choose an optimized combination of various uh, risk control measures, not just about uh, physical containment, but can be a training or type of this kind of thing. PPE can be considered. So the most important thing is to choose the right combination um, in this point. And then after uh, some work, you have to review the risks and the risk control measures are okay or not. If in case you have some issues, then you may want to review your uh, risk control measures and then you may wish to implement something new, some add something, uh, so as to mitigate the um, further risks that you felt. Well, uh, with this table, uh, let's make a little bit of exercise. Suppose you are going to work with uh, vaccinia virus, or measles, or rabies virus, where vaccination is available, and of course training can be done. Uh, in the scenario one, you don't have any vac vaccination for some reason. And hmm, no training. Of course, in this case, remaining risk will be very high. In the second scenario, yes, you receive a vaccination, that's a good thing but mm, no training so far. That means that uh, you may be protected thanks to vaccination, but you may have a high likelihood of generating aerosol and things like this because of the poor training or poor performance. And then in this case, remaining risk will be high, if not very high. The third scenario, um, yes, you have received training, but unfortunately vaccination is not yet be done, and then uh, remaining risk remains high. And finally, in the fourth scenario, you received vaccination and proper training, and all these uh, combined together make the remaining risk low, and now you can go ahead. Core requirements. As I said that we are no longer talking about conventional biosafety level, uh, one, two, three, four, this type of thing. But we are now thinking about core requirements. Core requirements refer to a combination of elements to be implemented and used as a minimum requirement for safe working and during the majority of laboratory procedures. And most of the diagnostic laboratories can be covered with these um, core requirements, um, including codes of conduct, the laboratory facility equipment, of course, um, you need some decent uh, laboratory facility equipment and containment uh, devices. And competent and appropriately trained staff. These are extremely important. As I said, training uh, is essential even when you are in a nice um, physical facility. And good microbiological practices and procedures, just like training or staff competence, and strict observance of SOP and basic uh, good microbiological techniques will uh, save you a lot. And these are absolutely essential at all types of all levels of laboratories.
That means that human factors are <coughs> extremely important. According to literature survey, most of the、uh, reported and documented incidents and accidents are relating to a broad sense of human factors, not just lack of、uh, physical containment, but more of human factors. That is the reality. And I would like to say that even the best designed and most engineered laboratory is only as good as its least competent worker. And core requirements will be fundamental to safe working practice、uh, of any facility.、Um, core requirements, but、um, as you assess risk increase, then you may want to add some more heightened control measures. Take、uh, this model, a risk assessment process. Suppose、um, in the beginning, your initial risk, assessed risk, looks、mm, very high. At this stage, you cannot go ahead as it is. And then <clears throat> that means that you have to think about implementing certain risk control measures, as I said, a right combination of certain、uh, control measures. And then after implementing these、um, Risk control measures, then the risk、uh, will be reduced, and then now residual risk of laboratory ac activity looks low. And then,、uh, with this、uh, um, stage, you can go ahead and you can now start laboratory activity successfully. We have、um, templates for risk assessment process. To facilitate your local risk ass assessment practices, we have some short、uh, version and also long version for complex、uh, research activities. And we are also providing、uh, exemplary、uh, risk assessments for you to understand exactly what we are talking about.、Uh, but for some people, a l g o r i t h m of risk assessment may look rather complicated and difficult. Uh, with this reality,、um, we have developed a certain matrix that is going to be transcribed in、uh, smartphone apps and things like this, so that、uh, if you answer some of the key questions, then we can provide um, important um, elements that you have to think about based upon、uh, your planned activities.、Uh, we are、uh, going to provide you. Uh, this kind of apps、um, reasonably soon.、Uh, in summary,、um, we have、uh, talked about、um, WHO's LBM4, Laboratory Biosafety Manual 4th edition, and its、uh, risk based approach, including you know,、uh, it aims at flexible and locally applicable approach, and then、uh, complementary to existing national regulations. You still have to follow, of course,、uh, existing national regulations. And、um, this、uh, document can be used by diagnostic, research, production, animal, and human laboratories of all kinds. And it's intended to prevent exposure and release of infection, infectious agents. And as I highlighted before, that good microbiological practice and procedures remain critically important. If you want to learn more about this kind of approach,、um, LBM4 Laboratory Biosafety Manual 4th Edition is freely applicable,、uh, downloadable with this link. And also, we are providing some more resources with this WHO's biosafety homepage. In closing my presentation today, I want to express my sincere thanks to all the contributors and generous donors mentioned in this final slide. Thank you very much indeed for your kind attention.